Hello everyone, bringing you a video today featuring an interview I conducted with Don McDowell, who was an Australian Army captain who served in Vietnam in an advisory role as part of the Australian Army Training Team Vietnam in 1964 to 1965. Very kindly agreed to come on and have a chat to me, recall some of his experiences. It does go a little bit beyond that particular period and talks a little bit about his uh, work in intelligence after that point. And continuing work relating to Vietnam. So without further ado, we'll get into the main part of the video and let uh, Don recount some of his memories. Thank you very much indeed, as I say again, for, for agreeing to, to come on and, and have a chat with me about your, your experiences. So what I normally ask at the start is if you could just give a very brief sort of start and end of your, your military service and, and a little bit of, of overview of, of where you went and what you did in between, and then we'll talk more specifically if, if you're happy with that about your the time with Australian Army training team Vietnam. So, so when did you when did you join first off? Um, I joined at the beginning of January 1959. Yes. And went to officer college, mm -hmm. and um, graduated at the end of the year, and graduated into um, Army engineers. Yes. Um, like most of us, young second lieutenants. Um, went into training and yeah. in, in fact spent a whole year training to be an engineer officer and then there being no jobs for second lieutenants i went to another whole year of training just to kill time basically right, okay. <laughs> i learned to be a, ma a, a mariner and a ship's master um, right and then i followed that with a year at sea with the army and in command of various vessels. And at the end of that, I went to our language training academy right. and spent right. a year learning Vietnamese. And this would be 63 by the time. Well, that was 63 by the time I'd finished that. Mm -hmm. um, I came out of that and did several rather special training courses. Um, uh, Army intelligence uh, yes. for a few weeks, yeah. um, escape and evasion with army intelligence, um, parachuting um, twice because I got injured halfway through, but oh, right. went <laughs> yeah. uh, then back to doing um, training with the Secret Service. Um, to be told that this was mid-year by then, I was heading off to Vietnam to join this new unit, the Australian Army Training Team. Yes. And that was, six, that, that was, that was 64, 65. Yes. That, that was 64. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd been picked because um, I was a linguist. I was an engineer. I'd been trained in infantry work. Um, I was trained as a navigator. So I had all sorts of skills that they were looking for, yes. not just basic <laughs> infantry skills. Um, and the Secret Service training taught you to do all sorts of spooky things, um, rather like um, um, OSS in America and SOE mm. in Britain in World War II. Pardon me. So that was mid-64, and I went to Vietnam on the 14th of August that year and stayed and came home on the 22nd of August the following year. Yes. Um, the rest of my career, uh, I came back to Australia, but things were fairly unhinged and disorganised in those days. Uh, it was a time of great opportunity to volunteer for everything. Yes. Um, in, in order not to be... Um, mistreated by an army system that was fairly heavy-handed. Mm. Um, so I kept volunteering for stuff. And when I came back to Australia the day I arrived, um, I went back. I had no orders. You know, get on a plane. When you get off, you're on your own. And I thought, I'm a captain and I'm in uniform and I have nowhere to go. No. <laughs> so I went back to the unit I'd left in 1962, um, when I'd been running ships up and down the Australian mm. coast, and my commander saw me walking in his office, and his first words were, good grief, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. 
He <laughs> had no jobs for a young officer he hadn't seen for three years. Um, uh, and he was quite angry about me being foisted upon him. He went to lunch that day with the deputy director of intelligence, who was quite concerned that he couldn't find officers who had anything to offer intelligence mm -hmm. and had any experience in intelligence related activities. Then he discovered over lunch that I'd had all these courses and war experience. And two days later, I was in Canberra in intelligence. Intelligence, yes. And that's how I got into it. All happy accidents, serendipity, yes. you know, acceptance on my part of, you know, something good always happens. And I'm assuming when, when you did your intelligence training, it was a was that a switch from the Royal Australian Engineers to the Intelligence Corps? You, you changed I was on I was on loan to the Intelligence right. Corps. Got but you. after the first couple of years, by 67 or so, I formally transferred to yes. the Intelligence Corps. And you said you, you, you were in Vietnam again briefly in 67. Yeah, um, the Battle of Long Tan, which was our biggest, most memorable battle in Vietnam, had happened in 66 on my watch while I was heading up the intelligence room in Canberra for Army. Um, and uh, I'm in the intelligence room on Vietnam, yes. specifically. Yeah. Um, and I had followed that battle. I'd foreshadowed that sort of fighting for the month leading up to the battle. And as a result, I was known to the chief of the general staff personally, because I briefed him every day for a month. Um, when the long tan battle occurred, a number of mistakes were clearly discernible and I had written about them and drawn attention to them and been told to just watch what happens um, surely the commander of the task force knows what the enemy are doing. And I'd said, well, they're reading the same stuff I'm reading. Um, assumedly so. It turned out, no, that wasn't the case exactly. And the chief of the general staff, Sir Thomas Daly, asked me, <laughs> ordered me in early 1967 to go up to Vietnam with a cover story and accompanied by two more senior officers who didn't know what I was doing. But I had to interview people um, in a rather secretive manner and find out what the hell had gone wrong. Mm, yes. So it only took three weeks. Um, and it was really interesting to do that, mm. um, to discover that, um, of all things, secret um, radio intelligence, SIGINT, the, the, the word that yes. we use, it was being processed by a, a signals platoon in the task force, yeah. headed by a captain whom I knew because I'd met him and I'd worked with him at college. Um, and his take on the war from SIGINT was handed directly to the brigadier um, in charge of the yes. task force. Mm -hmm. The task force commander had ordered that because SIGINT was regarded as uh, pa flashy and posh and yeah. wonderfully secretive and what a joy to have it in his little hands. Mm. Yes. Um, but he didn't share it with the rest of the task force intelligence. Right. I the see. task force intelligence people got all the collateral non-SIGINT stuff. Me in Canberra with my sergeant, we were reading everything about all of Vietnam, not just for three profit. Ironically, you had a, a better handle of what was going on than yes. the men on the ground. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and of course the task force had gone into Phuc Thuy province, where I lived for my year. I was the yes. only officer yeah. that had been there that had been posted into that province. So it was all my old stamping ground, and I was fairly familiar with the enemy in that province anyway. So it was a happy connection, yes. Um, really, for in in the mind of the the chief of the general staff. 
Uh, for me, it was a wonderful thrill at the age of 26 to be going back to do a secret investigation. Yes. Um, not a view shared by many people afterwards, unfortunately, mm. because I was regarded as ultimately when the story came out as being bigger than my 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 britches. Yes, you I know, understand. Yes, exceeding I, my, yes. after all, I was only a young captain. Yes. Why was I trusted this way? Well, you know, what the hell? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that that brief stint to carry out the investigation in, in Vietnam again in '67, and then where yeah. did you go from from there up to your your oh, point um, the army? By the time I'd spent yet another year at army headquarters mm. in uh, in my job as head of intelligence um, for Vietnam, uh, my boss had decided that it was probably time for me to go and have a say in how the army trained its strategic intelligence people. So I was assigned to the Army Intelligence Centre, right, which was in Sydney, and then it moved to Adelaide. Mm -hmm. And I was senior instructor for strategic intelligence until the middle of 1969, when it was time for me to rotate and also be promoted to major. And the army said, well, it's time you came back and did some proper soldiering and you're going to go to an infantry battalion as a major uh, in administration and then you'll go to uh, a training job at a centre somewhere. And I said, uh, coincidentally, the American embassy had approached our embassy in Saigon um, and asked for me to be assigned to them in Vietnam as a major in charge of psychological warfare for four corps, which was the Delta area. And this was because while I was at the School of Military Intelligence, I was asked, did I know anything about psychological warfare? Because one of my jobs in Vietnam was running the new National Psychology Warfare Centre. Mm -hmm. um, a CIA invention, um, but then I was I spent my whole time in Vietnam assigned to CIA. So, right. Um, I should explain that the training team was only only a thousand and nine people served yes. in the whole of the war in Vietnam, um, and usually in lots each year of about a hundred or so. But within the hundred each year something like four or five at maximum were singled out and moved quietly out of the normal mainstream of training yes. Um, yes. and away from Americans and Vietnamese. And we were um, assigned to CIA and we worked on one of the CIA programs in a, an organisation called Combined studies division mm -hmm. uh, in my case it was running the national Psy war center uh, and that included also raising and training a company of paramilitary troops so that all my students every six weeks could go out bush and get real experience in a lightly enemy held village and my company would be do the protective insertion a guarding and extraction so yes. we were yes. you know it was an interesting yeah. job but because of the fact that it was to do with psychology i got this job to write the army's manual of psychological warfare operations um and the americans in oh 69 had asked our embassy, could I come up to Vietnam and take on the role of psychological mm. warfare advisor as a major for four core area, the, the Delta Zone. The Army's attitude to that was, no, you've already been once and it's not your turn. Um, and my attitude was, I've put in 10 years, um, I've done a fairly reasonable job I'll go and do something else. So I resigned. Right. Yes, because of that, that attitude on the part of the army. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I was called an ingrate, and I thought, no, no, no. I've I've done something valuable. Mm. I believed. Um, I'm happy to part company, so I did. Yes. And ever yes. since, apart from some years in the national um, c- civil service out here, um, I've been an international consultant on intelligence matters. So, yes, here I am, semi retired. Yes. And, as you see, aging beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to reverse slightly, to, to rewind slightly yes. back to back to 64, because that's fantastic, the, the yeah. overview there. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. The Going back to 264, so you find out you're, you're heading out to Vietnam. Um, yeah. where, could you take us through a sort of timeline of your experience in that year you were, you were out there? Where, where did you arrive at first? And, and I arrived in Saigon. <clears throat> well, uh, most of the Australian troops who went to Vietnam went, went in job lots. Yes. filling half yes. an aeroplane or whatever. Uh, I went up with another captain. I, I have no idea why. Um, it all seemed to be scrambled haste um, with him and I both being told, well, we've, we're treating you as special because you're not travelling with other people. You'll fly up by yourself. So he and I flew to Singapore um, on Qantas, Yes. Um, yes. Got there and were meant to be looked after by your countrymen at Far Eastern Land Force Headquarters mm-hmm. who didn't want a bar of us. Britain's attitude right. was right. Vietnam is a bad thing. Australians shouldn't be there. We don't like you because you're going there. So my, my friendly captain and I were put in the other ranks tent lines in Singapore and not encouraged to visit the mess, the officer's mess at all, which we just thought was a bit of a giggle and fairly stupidly pommy in the way it was done. Definitely fair is that. It seems strange, particularly, I mean, obviously that's still very much, you know, obviously there's not been the major troop commitment by the US or Australia at that point in terms of the, you know, the uh, battalion to the 173rd or even the task force. Yeah, yeah, no, no. it, it seems a strange attitude at that point, particularly because the involvement is in an advisory role rather than very yeah, strange. Very yeah. strange. Well, we never got the full story because no. we weren't invited to meet any officers. No. Um, um, we spent a week in Singapore um, and then hopped on a Pan Am plane and flew to Saigon. And on arrival in Saigon, put up overnight and then separated. Stuart went off to his headquarters in Saigon, which was the training team's headquarters. He was to become their adjutant. And I was put on a plane and flown up to near the DMZ, near the city of Hue, and told I was going to be an infantry instructor on map reading. Right. And I look, I, I'm considered this, I mean, I, you'd follow orders, but I, I thought, surely all this year's worth of spook training and all the rest of it, it isn't now going to result in me just teaching people map reading. And about three weeks later, you know, no, two weeks later, an army caribou landed at the base just south of way and out stepped a guy I'd spent years with in the Air Force cadets, um, who was commander of the the Caribou. And he said, oh, what are you doing here? They're waiting for you in Vong Tau. Um, Yet another army snafu. I was going to say, it's been a balls up somewhere there, yes. (laughs) Yes. Um, So I went to my major and said, I hear that I'm not meant to be here. So he got on the radio to... Uh, down south in Saigon and surely yeah that was right um, so the next flight that was available I hopped on and went down to Vung Tau to be met by a captain an army Australian army captain who said you're here to take my place as um, co-commandant of the National Cywall Centre here at Cat Lo in Vung Tau but I've booked us both to Hong Kong for five days R&R and we leave tomorrow. 
So I went off to our oh. owner. I mean, you just do what you're told, basically. When I came back, Peter, the, the army captain, he was a short timer and he packed up and went off to Saigon and back to Australia. I then was a, was fitted into my role to become co-commandant with a Vietnamese captain called Min, um, who, curiously enough, been part of the Viet Minh in the war that preceded our war in Vietnam, Very but had changed sides, yes. yes. Lovely, lovely guy who appeared through my year to be totally loyal to the South, but not terribly sanguine about its chances at all. Um, and my life consisted for that year of firstly raising and training my paramilitary company um, in infantry minor tactics and looking at the curriculum that was running at the centre, which was six weeks curriculum for about 100, 150 students drawn from all over South Vietnam, put through their paces to learn about propaganda and military civic action and also self-protection. So I had a lot of contact with them when it came to small arms training and whatever. And then um, I would take them bush at the end of their six weeks and we'd add an extra week and insert ourselves into one of the many villages in Phuc Thuy province, just up the road from um, the Vung Tau Peninsula. Um, and we always picked a, a village from which we'd had several reports of enemy action and fighting, but not heavy enough to deter us. So we establish a perimeter, let the kids do their, because they were all young. Well, I was young too, but let them do their thing. And their thing involved talking to uh, the villagers about what their government was doing for them which was precious little at that time, but more inclined towards what their government intended to do for them um, in as persuasive a manner as they could sell that message. And we ran medical clinics, we ran uh, classrooms as extra teachers. We did um, help for the villagers, digging and cleaning drains and um, uh, clearing roads, uh, help fixing buildings, lots of practical stuff that was designed to say, look at us, we're from the government, but we're actually here to do stuff for you. Yes, and, and um, able to defend against yes, the, the yes. at the same time. And, yeah. and for the most part, that worked very well for the week we were there. But of course, at the end of that week, you leave. Only to bring the, the kids out two or three courses later again. So maybe two or three months later, we'd come back to that same village. There were quite a few villages that we had to visit. So it was sort of cyclical. I'd go to Hualong one month. I'd go to Dat Do the next month. I'd go to uh, Phuc Hai the month after, and then I might come back to Hualong again. But in the meantime, we were keeping a watching brief on how had the villagers gone uh, in our absence after we'd left them and what could we expect next time we went back. And all the time we were with the villagers, we were trying to not only help them with self-help projects um, and us pitching in yes. to do goals or do whatever, but we're also asking them what was going on, what were the VC like, what were the messages they were giving, what was the motivation that they were seeking to establish amongst the villagers, what was what was the the apparent goals of their propagandising, and so on, and what threats did they use, or what. Um, what uh, uh, measures to encourage the villagers yes, did they? What yeah. incentives they might be using? Yes, yes. that's yeah. right. That's, that's right. It was a really interesting year. It was a fascinating year, yes. frankly.
And um, the reason, I think, part of the reason why I'm so happy about the arms, the, the service that we did in Vietnam, as part of language training, you spend 46 weeks of the year reading everything and listening to everything about the language and the country and the culture and the politics and the history, not just the words in Vietnamese and what do they mean in English, but the whole social structure of that country. So I'd gone to Vietnam believing in the cause of helping the South Vietnamese avoid becoming overwhelmed by North Vietnamese ambitions. And by the time I left that year, I was quite convinced we would put in a fairly good effort trying to help as many villagers and villagers as we could. Um, it, by the time I went back in 67, it was all rapidly going downhill. Yes. And so yes. his focus had, had completely shifted away from doing good to getting runs on the board by killing people using their Phoenix program. I was going to ask if you'd noticed a, a major change in, in the, uh, the three year, well, the, the two years between yes. your uh, leaving and then going returning to, to Vietnam, if you'd noticed yeah, a significant yeah, absolutely. change on the ground. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the changes was, I mean, the unforeseen consequence of sending me back. Um, and I discussed this in my briefing with the chief of the general staff when I came home, was that instead of seeing Vietnam through my younger eyes as a place where advisors could do some good, I came back to seeing Vietnam where Australians, once you put hundreds of them together, act for all the world like Americans. Um, yes, our tactics are different, but the group think of large units completely undoes some of the good that small advisory groups can do. Um, that was a surprise, apparently, not just to me, but to others around me. Yes. And I don't think our army was over-invested with, with deep thinkers. Um, you, you know, one of the good reasons for going to the, the Vietnam War was always going to be that we needed a war to practice our art. So any war was good enough, and here we, this was one with a good excuse. Once you get together and you've got the group think of two or 3,000 people in the same task force at the one time, then everything outside the wire is the enemy, everything. Um, whereas when we were there as advisors, um, you were always cautious and alert, but you always were prepared to be su surprised pleasantly when you met good Vietnamese and good families and good teachers and good doctors. And you could distinguish um, to a degree um, the, the good people from the naughty people, so to speak. I've, I've lectured a lot about Vietnam since then. I mean, it's a good 50 years ago or so. Uh, and I teach Vietnamese language occasionally. I'm about to embark on doing some more courses. Um, and I still think we did the right thing. I, I think we were hoodwinked by our politicians and uh, the way our unions acted rather like they did in Britain in some cases, uh, to deflect um, army intention, um, to sabotage efforts to supply troops abroad, all that sort of stuff. Apart from all those things, I still think we did a passingly good job, but our hands were tied behind our backs and the South Vietnamese politically weren't up to the challenge. South Vietnamese people were lovely and hardworking and to a degree honest in an Asian way. Yes. And I'll let yes. you unpick that. Um, their politics was, you know, just, just like any other corrupt country. 
Um, so we were never going to win out there. I mean, now that we're all leaving Afghanistan, it comes as a surprise to people that we haven't been able to manage a lasting peace. All I suggest is you go back and read three or 400 years of history and you won't be surprised. Absolutely so, yes. So obviously talking a little bit about the the, the chances of success and so forth, you mentioned that Captain Min was, was quite... Um, I guess, sort of fatalistic almost. What, what did you share his opinion, or what? What did, did no, he, think he wasn't. Chances? He wasn't overtly fatalistic. Right. Okay. He was just resigned to the fact that it was very much an uphill battle, and for every forward step we seem to make, um, with a great deal of enthusiasm on our part, he'd be we'd be let down occasionally and sometimes often by provincial officials or district officials or even some of the Saigon people. He didn't have much faith in the CIA people who came down to visit us, um, nor did I. Um, they were all, uh, they were a strange mix. A lot of them were sad leftovers from the Bay of Pigs and the Plain of Jars disasters in Laos uh, and Cuba. Um, and others amongst them were desk warriors, you know, arriving in country in the in the middle of the countryside, wearing a seersucker suit with a polka dot bow tie. Um, it does something, and uh, none of it good to the way the troops react to seeing these people uh, step off a plane. Uh, all important, and with nothing useful to say. Um, we, we, Min and I both found that we tried to give briefings on how the courses were progressing, how our uh, wins and losses in the countryside were going when we went on village exercises. Um, nobody seemed to want to listen. What they wanted was how many students are we putting through? Are we getting the right calibre? Do we need more help with weapons? out of Okinawa stores and so on. Um, it was all box ticking stuff and yes. nothing about what the hell's going on. Giving people numbers to crunch. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And obviously you mentioned obviously the weapons and so forth would have been provided by the US. Was the yes. doctrine you, you taught US inspired or did you have some No, no, no. Freedom? No, I had a free hand. Yes. Um, I yeah. used British... Uh, I had been trained in the Army Cadet Corps to, in infantry minor tactics, tactics by a series of films produced by the British War Office at the end, during and at the end of World War II. And when I went to our academy, Officer Academy, yes. the same tactics were still Army doctrine. Um, and it's all simple stuff, you know. There's a, and it was based on the platoon in battle. Um, you could step it up and do the company in battle, and we learned how to deploy battalions in battle, but most, mostly it was small unit stuff. The Americans, when I'd gone up on arrival to that place up north near the demilitarized mm -hmm. zone, um, they were teaching uh, battalion and regiment stuff. And the reason they wanted Australians to help them was officers in the American system um, were um, meant for higher things. And when it came to teaching grunts how to read a bloody map, um, all a bit difficult and a little esoteric and why bother? So we Australians did that sort of grunt work. Um, so I taught, um, I, I insisted, at the centre that I worked at, that everything I taught them was consistent with Australian doctrine because it had worked. Yes. Um, yeah. And the, the, the units you were training were of around platoon size, I assume, so it fitted quite yes, well with, yes, yeah, it fitted yes. well with the, the units yes. you were training specifically. And, and obviously in, within the villages and so forth, as you were saying, they, they were, the units you were training were providing civil assistance uh, at the same time. Yes, but yeah. 
with, with when these units had been trained, what was their role then? They went out and, and protected certain areas, or did they go, did they carry on sort of with moving from village to village as, as you during done the during the six, the latter during the six weeks of a training course, I filled in time for the platoons that made my company, um, either doing more training to get them to be. Uh, even more expert at doing the tactical stuff that I was teaching them. Or I took them out on operations and we go and sweep into villages, visit with the village chief and, and um, local officials and what have you. To select the villages, I had very close ties with the province chief, Colonel Dutt, and I would go to him and say, you know, week after next, I want to take my platoons somewhere, where have you been having trouble lately? And he'd say, the village post in Hoi Mi um, it has been reporting uh, aggressive patrolling by a Vietnam, a Viet Cong platoon or, or squad. Um, could you go there? And yeah. he would often <laughs> come with me on the day we inserted, and then he'd go back to province headquarters and leave us to roam around and cause mayhem uh, and disruption to the enemy. And then we'd yeah. leave again after a few days. So we were yeah. constantly in and out of the field yes. the whole time. Yeah. And just for, for, for clarity, how were you inserted on these operations? Did you go in by helicopter or was oh, it? No, uh, no. no. I, I only once ever went in the helicopter in Vietnam. And that was when I went back in 67. Mm. Um, and um, just to divert, uh, in the northeast part of the province, uh, in the large mountains that are there, it was believed that the Viet Cong held those mountains completely. And we should go and have a look, which is a strange way of planning anything. Well, we got into a Bell helicopter and uh, the major that was with me and the pilot occupied the seats and I took a jump seat. And when we got to the Maytow Mountains, we went down to just below mountaintop height and flew between them. And I was asked, would, I was told, to stand on the skids with a belt tied round me and attached to the helicopter, carrying this Bell and Howell heavy uh, movie camera and take photographs of the mountains. And we would have a look at the, not photographs, the film. We would have a look at the film when we got back. So I, that was my helicopter ride, leaning yes. out attached by a strap over enemy area and thinking, this is exciting, but... But, but yes, <laughs> uh, yes, Funny. prime a prime target if someone did decide to uh, to have a crash yes. the, the helicopter. No, yeah. I, I I think they would have been so damn surprised yes. <laughs> that they wouldn't have time to react. Um, to back to uh, the operations that I led with my troops, um, we always went by road, always. Um, occasionally we had an armoured car of really strange vintage. I, I had never seen it, anything like it. I'm told it was an early model called a Panhard, which was mm. World War II or pre-World War II, owned by the French. Um, uh, but it was all too much trouble. It was easier to walk with the troops rather than, you know, pretend you... you you got special treatment and the poor body troops had to walk behind. I didn't enjoy that. Um, so I walked everywhere with my guys. Yes. Or went by yes. yeah. Well, it's certainly, mate, it, it, that's certainly a better way to ingratiate yourself to the troops as well is, is to... Uh, oh, yeah, the with them, troops yeah. were fine. But, I mean, remember that I had an interpreter that I hardly ever used because I... And my warrant officer, who, does, who was assigned to me, um, I spoke Vietnamese and I spoke it fluently. So um, it was no great difficulty to be with the troops. And that, that lifted a lot of the barriers that otherwise existed. Um, and 
frankly, it's always been my experience then and since when I've used them, that if you listen carefully to what an interpreter is saying and the cadence and the structure of the sentence, obviously, by the flow of words, you can discern how much of what you intended is not being exactly translated. Yes, how much and paraphrasing is going on. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, and in fact, we were taught to paraphrase, but the hardest thing we were ever examined on was word for word concurrent translation. And few people do that. Anyway, that, yes. it was yeah. easy, easy patrolling um, because you, all the villages are reachable by road. Um, and when we got there, we would meet the local chiefs, whatever, tell them what we were doing. Um, ask them for their situation report and then patrol and set up a defensive perimeter and so on and get to know people and go back into that information gathering mode. I was going, of to, yeah. I was going to ask about that because obviously you mentioned you'd, you'd speak to the local population about what had been yes. going on and so forth and yeah. presumably that got fed back to form a bigger picture of, of what was going on in the in the in the area or was it primarily for you to use in your local operation for me to for me to use and feed back to the province chief see the province chief had total command of all regular south vietnamese troops in his province and all irregular troops um, so my duty was as senior cia case officer for colonel that to go back to colonel that and say, this is what we're finding, this is what we're hearing. And we would then discuss, well, what, are we, what is he going to do next about that? And you feel, obviously, as you're saying, you feel that this this part of your, so the advisory period in 64, 65, it was, you obviously did the best you could, but how, how successful do you feel those operations were as a whole? Um, we only had one case out of the whole year's worth, where the village was attacked while we were there. When I went back in 67, I met two senior colonels um, of the Viet Cong who had been in province at the same time as I had. So this is um, not in 67. Uh, I went back to do a film with our state broadcasting service in 2015 and I met these two colonels who'd been back there in 64-5 while I was there. They had known what we were doing and they had decided not to challenge us for the most part because they were scared of, apprehensive, not scared, of the American reaction because the nearest major reaction force was up in Bienoir, the 173rd Brigade. Um, and, of course, there was a supporting airport at Bung Tau for fighter or fighter-bomber aircraft to be deployed. So they, uh, what would you say, they minded their P's and Q's. Yes. <laughs> except this one occasion, and I had stumbled really on them, um, causing mayhem in a village called Hoi Mi. And I went in and met the province, uh, the post commander, a young second lieutenant, who lived in a post about 50 metres square, surrounded by a barbed wire fence, on slightly rising ground, mm. in that 50 metres square, he had maybe two squads of local paramilitary troops and himself, and that was it for the village. Now, the village was both it was primarily a rice harvesting village, um, and, yeah, rice harvesting, boy, me. And so we... I took us in there, and I only took a platoon with me on that occasion. We bedded down inside of this 50-metre square uh, lager, and on the very first night, while we were lying asleep, 
having posted guards, um, we were awakened by machine gun fire coming through the hut that we were sleeping in, which is a, a quick wake up. Definitely. Yes. But, but the silly thing is, of course, you know, when you're on a rise and people are in the in the gu- bottom, uh, the gully, then the only way the shots are going to come through the shed is on a rising trajectory. So all the bullets went overhead and out the top, um, and none of us got hurt, showered with bits of bamboo, but that's about all. But then we had to do aggressive patrolling for the next couple of days. And they kept creeping up and having pot shots. Um, Nothing more serious than that. And then we pulled out of that particular village and as an object lesson to the post, when the post uh, commander, the second lieutenant, did his patrolling after we'd left, they ambushed his patrol and shot him and about eight people dead. And the Vietnamese reaction was to pull out and not have a post in that village. Right, so they essentially yeah. surrendered that to the Viet Cong. Yeah, they, yeah. Did. they did. I got involved again because when the the Viet Cong had raided and ambushed that uh, post patrol, I was asked by Colonel Dat to take my troops back down and protect the village um, and then look after the uh, survivors and the families of the survivors because Vietnamese practice was the families lived in the post with their soldiers. Yes. yes. And I can remember that night it was pouring monsoon rain of uh, not being able to find the families until I got the word that they were up at the morgue in the province capital. So I drove back to the capital and the province morgue was a tin shed like a two-car garage. And uh, the families didn't want to go in, but each one of them had a photograph of their loved ones. And so I spent my night going in and identifying bodies and coming out and looking after the families. Informing them. Uh, yeah, it was sobering stuff. Um, nothing, maybe I'm strange, but I just thought, well, this is a job. You, you do it. You know, I don't like looking at dead bodies or anything, but I don't know anyone who does. Um The sadness was I went and paid my respects to the family of that second lieutenant after the event about two weeks later and was ushered in with an awful lot of ceremony and um, Mm. gratitude and all the rest of it and drinking tea and admiring the photographs and the wife in tears. Oh, dear. It was sad. Absolutely, yes. But... But it, it, we okay. lost that village. Yes, you're right. We lost that village. Yeah, and and I well, a, a disappointment. But obviously, the call wasn't. The call came from higher up, I suppose. So it's it's one of those things. The decision was taken, and yeah. yeah. I never did find out from the colonels fifty years later whether they'd ordered that attack, or whether that was just the local VC squad. Deciding, deciding it wasn't going to take any nonsense from my troops. Yes, yes. <laughs> you just, yeah, as I say, it, it's an interesting one because I, I, I'm aware of, of that sort of thing going on, as you say, where a local yes. unit would just decide to uh, to go and have a, a well, you know, go and have a crack, I suppose you could say, not take any nonsense is exactly as you say, but uh, yeah. it's yeah. an interesting one. Um, yeah, but, but your, I presume that night, the attack, uh, when everyone was roused and... and moved to defend, they, they then withdrew and obviously the patrolling that you carried out oh, yes. back, didn't find the, any... At the moment we threw a few grenades over the wire, um, they just melted away. Yes. But that's yes. what they're good at. That's what exactly. yes. guerrilla fighting is all about. Um, Americans, I found Americans found it hard to understand that um, and their reaction was to use their might to go off in hot pursuit. And I thought a raining night, um, 
pitch black, of course, because no no ambient light when it's overcast and raining. Running around in the dark was not the cleverest thing to do when you don't know exactly how many people you've got out there. Um, and the answer was uh, the, the issue was negated um, by uh, the fact that none of their shots were striking home at all. They were all going through the bamboo walls. <clears throat> so we were lying there. We were giggling at one yes. stage. <laughs> Me and the second lieutenant and his wife were giggling because aren't they stupid? You know, don't they work out that if you lie in a ditch and aim upwards, you're not going to hit anything? But uh, yes, that's almost a sort of, well, not nervous laughter even at that point. As you say, if you've realised that you're you're actually safe from the fire that, uh, that's, that's yeah. incoming, then yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. But, it's, uh, not always, you... it's not always like that, Simon. No, absolutely no. not. No, <laughs> no, I was going to say, um, but... But it's, it's it's very interesting because it is a classic, as you say, it's the classic tactic, the harassment of a, of a, a fixed enemy position and then melt away into the night. Um, yeah. The common yeah. story of the we, opera. You know. We would do the same thing. If we mm. did a, an ambush, as we used to, um, you would open fire, you would eventually resolve the ambush and the enemy would be either down or they'd melt away into the bush, you know, mm -hmm. running helter-skelter to get away. Yes. What are you going to do? You're not going to run after them unless they were obviously carrying something of importance. You'd go out, grab the bodies, search the bodies, take whatever documents and weaponry that you could find and go back home or where, whatever you were going to do. Yes. But it wasn't yes. going to be, you couldn't stay in the same ambush position and running after the escapees was an act of futility. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So a, a nitty, a nitty, sorry, go on. Sorry. No, 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 go on. A, a nitty gritty detail, which I was just interested to ask about is obviously you, you mentioned the weaponry of the enemy there. How were yeah. the units you worked with equipped? Was it all US World War II surplus or? Um, except for M79 grenade launchers, which were post-World War II. Um, Swedish K machine pistols. Machine guns, submachine guns, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I was there. Were, I only had two of those. Um, all the rest of the time, we carried M1 carbines or M1 Garand rifles, World War Two stuff. Um, nobody had pistols except the officers, and there were only three Vietnamese officers and myself, and my warrant officer. Um, and we all had, they all had um, Colt 1911 um, standard automatics. I always carried a Browning 9mm because that's what I'd been brought up with. That was the weapon of choice of the Australian Secret Service. I felt very comfortable with the Browning 9mm, not with the bloody Colt. Yes. Why would you carry yeah. that thing? Half the extra weight. Bigger bullets, but only seven of them. Why would you do that? At least with a Browning, I had 13 bullets and one up the spout if I wanted. Yes. So, uh, yes, yes it was all... Familiar with. With, yeah, it was all war stock stuff out of US Okinawa um, uh, store units. Um, what else did we carry? Grenades were all those horrible American things, the little round, uh, very smooth balls. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think what they're called, but hand grenade with a totally smooth exterior with uh, wire wrapped inside the small, the smooth outer casing. Casing, yeah. <laughs> split and become shrapnel. Um, I missed the old 36 grenade that the Brits had developed. Thank you. But I couldn't get them. Same as I'd asked for friend guns. 
which I knew the Americans had because the Canadians had made Bren guns as well as the Brits. Now, the Okinawa people insisted I had to have um, the Browning automatic rifle, which is, uh, why would you bother? I mean, it's a nice, nice gun, but 20 round magazine yeah. um, underneath, so you had to roll the thing over to change mags. Silly gun. <laughs> Yes, the Bren would have been a, the Bren is, the, in a light machine yeah. gun role, the Bren is definitely the best yeah. of the two. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, we, I encountered one day walking across a bridge, the VC had taken the planking off and left a single plank running lengthways across the bridge, not crossways. So tiptoeing across the bridge, um, followed by a captain, who'd been assigned to me under training, an American. Tiptoeing across the bridge, two enemy snipers opened up and bullets were pinging off the bits of the bridge and the road at the end by the time I'd galloped, leapt in the air and galloped across. Um, going to ground, I could see where the enemy were and I only had that day my M1 carbine and they were a good 200 metres away. And my M1 carbine, I could have thrown it further than the bullets were going. And you could see them hitting more or less in line, but bouncing off dust and dirt and stuff. And unit troops came up behind me, and one of them had the Browning automatic rifle. And I picked it up, stood up, and from the shoulder fired a magazine. Well... You could see the fall of shot all over the place, but didn't get them. And I, I realised then it wasn't a patch on the Bryn. The Bryn would have been more controlled and better. Yes. Ah, yes. yes. Life's full of disappointments, I think. But you couldn't get them. I was going to say that's that's ah, that. Uh, yes. No use crying over spilt milk, no. so to speak. So. Uh, Presumably at the end of this period, and uh, was it August 65, you said you? Yeah, or August 64, okay. August, Yes. And you presumably had a period where you you, tra you transferred responsibility over to the, the incoming training team officer, or, oh, right, okay. So... No, you're being pulled... Oh, first of all, my warrant officer, mm. um, who was uh, Australian Infantry... Um, and then later SAS by the time he joined me he was a good tactician but he got sick while he was there and hardly ever came on operations with me and eventually by April of 65 he got so sick he was evacuated and treated off, off site out of province for a month or so yeah about a month then came back and then ordered home and went home and I never saw him again. So for the last May onwards, May, June, July and August, I was there alone. So when I was pulled out, for some reason they decided not to replace anyone in that job and um, I came home. And so it was a uh, uh, over. There was, it, it was rather, it was very telling to the Vietnamese that CIA had decided in this time frame to press ahead with a new camp in Vung Tau that was going to become super people's action team stuff that then became Phoenix program stuff. And CIA no longer wanted to have anything to do with the sort of low-grade people's action um, propaganda stuff I've been running. They just changed horses midstream and right. said, no, no, right. go, go for Phoenix. And just let your role die out. That was it. Then yes. the role yeah. just didn't exist anymore. Yeah. Yeah. The guy who um, notionally replaced me in Phuc Thuy province came in weeks after I left and was uh, assigned to the Phoenix program in Vung Tau City. So instead of being up 15 kilometres in my old camp, 
Um, nobody was. And that was sad. Um, the program continued, but it continued without any of the energy and very little of the support that CIA had been providing, rather sadly. Um, and do you think that was perhaps um, partly due to the US's shift to obviously sending their own troops and, and the fighting the war themselves to a greater degree? or To, to the extent that that action you described also brought with it a demand for um, return on investment. Mm. And return on investment was box ticking, numbers killed, numbers um, captured, and so on, weapons seized, etc. So the Phoenix program, which was very measurable in terms of how many have we killed this week, um, beat the heck out of my program, which was how many hearts and minds have we affected. There's no measurement for that. Well, no easy measurement. For that. It is very interesting yeah. the the deployments you were involved with and, and working very closely with the local population and so forth because it sounds a lot more similar to what had been going on in in Malaysia in the earlier earlier in the sixties and up to that point in terms of working with the you know the tribal groups and so forth in in the jungle there it's a lot more similar than perhaps some of the the tactics that we used a bit later on as you as you're saying yeah. more centralised. Uh, the, the more centralised approach that, that came in. Yes. So that's very interesting. Um, but you see, after uh, one of the uh, flow-on effects of Lyndon Johnson becoming president was that as he was getting trouble at home, um, the demand on the army generals for measurable successes became immense. And that in a way, translated to the Australians as well. And the Australian task force commander was being lent on to provide evidence of successes. And Australia's aggressive patrol program in Phuc Thuy province was all about how many villages have we gone into, how many enemy have we met, how many bodies can we count, and so on. Um, I it's laudable to ask people in the field to, re, to be able to brief you on what successes you've had, but that's purely tactical thinking. It's, there is nothing strategic in that approach. And that was the personal level problem I had, that we were losing sight of any strategic approach to fighting a war in Vietnam uh, we, we'd had it for, we'd been there 62, 3, 4, and 5, but by 5, we damn near lost that idea as we started to, to deploy troops and the Americans were deploying lots and lots. Absolutely. And also, oh. even on a tactical level, as you say, looking at what's going on in the field on, the, on in small detail, the metrics have to be right as well in order to yeah. actually assess success. Yeah as opposed to yeah. maybe just body count uh, or, or uh, pure numbers. Yes. Um, we had, if, if you've done a lot of reading, you realise we've had, we had had, and it continued through the war, incredible difficulty with KIA and WIA numbers um, because of double and triple counting and assumptive counting. I've found a machine gun. They always have three people per machine gun. Therefore, we've killed three people. No, we got a machine gun. That's all we got. Um, uh, and when I was back in Canberra running the intelligence desk for Vietnam for two years, uh, it was a consistent problem reporting to my government about the kill numbers um, when politicians who, God bless them, didn't want to spend much time learning anything, um, would say, but how come our kill numbers are down this week compared with last week? That's bad. We should do more. And you think, how, how do I unpack such a piece of stupidity to even begin to answer it? It, that's when people yeah. become too focused on one specific statistic and cannot yeah. get their yes. heads around any yeah. other measure of, of operational success. It's, yeah. Yes. 
Japanese won't be able to fly planes because they're all short. Uh, if you raise the seats, they'd be okay. I, I can't. I, I absolutely illustrative piece of pre pre Second World War um, uh, thinking there. Absolutely uh, a mm. bigotry, I suppose, which led to under underestimation on a grand scale. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I ask you? Yes, please. To pose my question in amongst all this. What are you doing this for? What is the outcome product of what you're doing? The aim is to record people's recollections of their, their military service in various <laughs> different scenarios. I've speak, spoken to British Army personnel serving in, who served in Northern Ireland during Operation Banner, chaps who yeah. served out in Malaysia during the Malaysia-Indonesia confrontation, uh, and, and people who still, you know, trying to get people's memories on records whilst they're still able to. And it's for YouTube, basically. It's just for public, publicly accessible. People can go and watch if they're interested and would like to hear of people's experiences. So that's oh, that's the end goal. It's not uh, it's not anything higher than that. I'm afraid it's just getting people's. I thought this might be your next PhD or something. It's not. No, this is entirely a hobby. Um, I, I collect military, or I'm very interested in military history. Yeah, I can see it behind. Yeah, you. yes, I was going to see all the respirators. It's ma <laughs> yeah. mainly 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 respirators there. Um, yeah. I do have an Aussie issue one here actually, but uh, anyway, uh, from the Second oh, World War. But uh, anyway, um, it, so so that's that's my main aim, and I, I do okay. I do reenactment events, which are not running around with a blank firing weapon for us. I, that's not what our group do. But we we do mobile museum displays with all the kits and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's actually a flying UH one near near me. Uh, the chap collected one, and he has open days at the hangar, and I'll quite often go and put on a display of Australian Vietnam era kit oh, yeah. and so forth. <laughs> Which I have quite... never been. I no. have never been in a Huey. No, 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 no. But uh, it's just a good place to go and make people aware that of it. A lot of yeah. people think purely it was an American war. They, I think, they don't even maybe they maybe think that the you know of the, the Vietnamese forces maybe, but they a lot of people don't realise that that Australia, New Zealand, Korea, and so on were involved. So uh, certainly Philippines think, and the Philippines, yes, yes. and yes. The, the display of of kit is a good way of getting people into a conversation and, and pointing out the, yeah. the Australian and New Zealand involvement out there, which is obviously... Oh, we left, out, we left out the North Vietnamese. Well, yes, indeed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. But uh, they certainly focus more on the American side of things, so I like to yeah. put that display on and, and get people talking, which is always is, is interesting. So, uh, some, of the, some of the fond memories I have of all this, because mm. I had a good war, you yes. know, there were horrible yes. bits. Uh, there were really some scary bits. Um, but by and large, you come home at the end of the day and gird your loins again and go out and do whatever it is next day without living in that group think atmosphere of the task force, which followed my involvement. Um, but some of the interesting things were... Australian Army, you're lucky if you fire off 100 rounds in a year on any given weapon, probably the main long rifle that yes. you're going to be issued with. In Vietnam, because CIA had money to burn and no problem with supply, I set a target of 100 rounds a day and managed to do that from the time I took over at the training centre Till the time I left. But every day I would vary the weapon I did it through so that it was either pistols, submachine guns, long guns, sniper rifle, um, those four categories. Um, and I just became very proficient and came home thinking, well, that's something the Army didn't allow me to develop, but CIA did. I'm very grateful. Yes, yes, I got to experience weapons that I never believed I'd have a chance to. I had a my own Schmeiser, German Schmeiser submachine gun. Um, I had the the grease gun that the Americans invented in World War Two. I had a Luger. I had a Walther P thirty eight. Um, 
And in fact, at one stage, my CIA chief in Saigon said with all those, he'd come down to the house and he'd seen I had 23 weapons lined up around the walls of my bedroom, all loaded so that if anybody attacked my house, I lived in a proper house in Vung Tau, I was able to direct fire from 23 weapons readily available to hand without bothering running around looking for magazines. Um, and he said, because you've got all these weapons, why don't you do a test on all the handguns we've got and how accurate they are at 100 and 200 yards? So I did that. That took two days to organise and run through. And um, I came back thinking, the old Browning is pretty damn good. The Walther P38 is excellent, but a bitch of a pistol to have to service in the field. Um, my Colt revolver, I had a four inch barrel Colt revolver. Um, it was pretty damn good if I had uh, super 38 rounds, but if I only had ordinary ammo, no. Nah. Not much good at all. So that's one little thing I came away with. The other thing that I learned was having graduated from military college and thinking I knew damn near everything about infantry minor tactics and what to do when you want to opportunistically engage the enemy or, on the other hand, when you want to hide from the enemy and avoid any nastiness. Um I discovered on a couple of operations, things don't go to plan. And whatever seems right at that moment probably is. And stop trying to remember what it says in the book of infantry minor tactics. I um, walked through the jungle one day with my Vietnamese captain friend, Captain Que, and we were following in hot pursuit an enemy patrol. And I had two scouts out in front of me and myself and Captain Quay were walking side by side and came to a banana tree, big banana tree. And we separated and went either side, at which moment exactly the banana tree got ripped apart by machine gun fire. And his attitude was draw his weapon, which he had a pistol, and shout, something like forward, Dian Lan, which is up an atom type language, and surge forward. And I had been to talking to him about the commander stops and assesses what the scouts report back. And so my immediate reaction was I leapt on his back and hit him on the back of the neck with my fist. And he and I both went down into the jungle floor and... He's trying to get up. Meantime, though, whoever the machine gunner was disappeared and the scouts went after it, never caught it. But I thought, it, if somebody said to me in a training class, how would you ensure that your lessons get through? None of that was in the book, but it just seemed appropriate. Yes, indeed. Yes. Yes. The other incident I always think of fondly is patrolling with um, two squads, not a full platoon, either side of um, a narrow track. And in the squad on the right, the one I was with, where I, I put my command, we came to a clearing, and not much of a clearing, about 20 metres square, maybe, if that. Um, and as I progressed across the clearing, automatic fire came from the front and some of my squad were out there and they were returning fire and almost at the same moment, automatic fire came from the right-hand side and the flank guards were having to engage whoever that was. Then a minute later or so, automatic fire from the rear 
And while all this is going on, because our guys are still returning fire, even though the incoming fire had slackened off, I thought, what am I supposed to do? This is one of those moments when nobody tells you what you're supposed to do. And there was a tree in the centre of the square. So I sat down at the base of the tree and just started to call out to the scouts and to the flank people and get reports. And in the after action, I thought, how am I going to tell my troops why it was that I sat down by the tree? And my captain came up and said, we thought that was very calm, what you did. Should I have said to him, no, I was apprehensive that I'd forgotten some important lesson. Um, he said, no, that was very calm and it made us all think seriously about what the captain wants us to do. Um, now I look back on it and think, yeah, would I tell people, look for the nearest tree? Probably not, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. It worked in that yeah. Yes. Yeah. As yeah. it was, it was two guys who had run lickety split round the whole uh, squad that I was with and disappeared off into the jungle. To, and gave that impression of a, yeah. of a, a, a larger yeah. force. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, these things happen. Silly things. Fascinating. Silly. Very ah. interesting to hear, though. It is. It's uh, these little, rec these specific recollections of, of specific yes. engagements. It's, it's very interesting. So, I mean, so that case I mentioned of crossing the bridge and being fired upon by two snipers, um, the captain who was assigned to me for training, George, he and I, when you cross the bridge, uh, surrounded by paddy fields below the height of the road, he and I laid at the abutment at the end of the bridge with our top half of the bodies on the road itself and uh, from below the torso down, down off the road. <coughs> at me. And George and I, he only had an M1 carbine as well, both returning fire. And all this time, the sniper's bullets were hitting off the road. Now, the road's only 12 feet wide or so. Um, and my recollection is we both thought this was really strange and funny. They had great weapons that had the reach, but they were bloody hopeless. Couldn't hit us for anything and we were both laughing aloud i'm going to have another go have you got another magazine george you know and off we'd go now i just think you know all the people i know would say get your head down but you can't see to shoot if you've got your head down um so it was weird nothing had prepared me for that you know are you scared not a, not a bit you're too busy frankly, too busy to be scared. And, and as you say, you have time to react based on yes. what seems right at the time. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. I think that was one of the really good things about Australian Army training, that when we were learning what to do, it was all about, you've, you've got a set of rules and protocols in place. You know, you get fired upon, the machine gun goes to the high ground, the rifles go round to the right, or whatever it is, the protocol of the day. But we were always encouraged to think for yourself. So if mortars are coming in, don't stand up, because when they hit the ground and explode, that's where the shrapnel goes. Mortars rely on you to lie down flat or in a depression. Um, I found working with Americans, because a lot of times Americans would come out with me, um, you know, two or three at a time, just to see what it was like and what we were doing. Uh, and they were on leave or they were bored and it was a day off from their routine duties. Um, they always wanted to follow set piece protocols. And we weren't trained that way. We 
We're trained to think things through, react on the spot, take in the, um, the environmental awareness of where you are, what's going on, where, who's where, who's doing what, what can we do about it, and process it in microseconds. Um, I, did, I was disappointed that, with one exception, most Americans had a standard answer. Get on the radio, call for artillery or whatever it happened to be, and you think, yeah, it doesn't work that way. No, it's not the answer to that. Yeah. Maybe that's why I'm, I probably never should be trusted with any unit above company size, because I think small. But ideal for the role you were, the advisory role you had. At the, at at the time, time, yes. At the time, yeah. yeah. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. You're very kind. Well, it sounds, from what you're saying, it sounds like that anyway. But uh, no, it's... Uh, it, it it is interesting to hear, and as you say, small unit warfare was was something that I think the well, obviously when the US did get involved, small unit warfare was not on the agenda for the US Army. But it's interesting no, to hear no. that, that there wasn't that focus even necessarily in the advisory advisory uh, period as much as well from from that point of view. The other thing too is that the Vietnamese Army had the same approach as the American Army. Mm. You know, as had the French, looking for set piece battle protocols rather than individualistic small patrols, etc. Yes. Um, yes. All of us at Language Academy had to read Bernard Fall's books, The Street Without Joy, and La Rue Sans Roi. Um, um, there's another one he wrote as well. It was all about the French army in the post. World War II, French, Viet Minh War. Um, I never met an American that had ever read any of that stuff. It's not important, save to give you a sense of awareness about their battles were very similar to ours and their mistakes, sadly, were very similar to the ones we were committing now or doomed to commit very shortly. Yes. A little bit of uh, not that it wasn't that distant history at the time as well as the crazy thing. No, you know, it was only no. ten years ten years prior, but uh, yeah, yeah, That's just right. over. When you think about it, yes, it was very current. Um, mm. But then that's that's been that's mirrored. Stuff? That's been mirrored yeah. in more recent times as well as a lack of a lack um, of look at recent history. In uh, none, none of us none of us knew of what we were getting into to go to Iraq. No. Um, or Afghanistan. Nobody had studied any of that at all. Um, I'd studied Afghanistan because I'd lived in Pakistan and as a diplomat worked in Afghanistan for one week of every month for a year um, and travelled extensively around the whole country. Um, as a student of history, um, anybody who goes into Afghanistan ought to read books on how to extricate yourself from quicksand because it's a bloody dreadful place. Wonderful people, really lovely country. Never see it again, unfortunately, because it's all been spoiled. But the idea that you can go in and think, well, we'll save the Afghan people from the Taliban and ISIS and whatever, I don't think it's going to happen. No. It, as you say again, a, la a lack of uh, a lack of sight eyes on history books. Uh, I think in that regard, yeah. definitely. I I did some work with American senior American intelligence officers in Washington when I was going over there, and um, we had a meeting at a steakhouse one night, and um, they were. They were really upset about what the American approach to Iraq and Afghanistan was. And I said to them, how many area specialists do you train? People who, like our language academy, make sure that all their graduates have to be masters of the history and sociology and politics and everything else of a target country. And they said, no, we don't do that anymore. 
we brief people with intelligence on what to expect when they get there, uh, on their way there. I found that really sad. I'm going to show you this map. Um, and I'm not sure whether you can see it very well. It's a map of Phuc Thuy province with Phuong Tao at the bottom on the peninsula. I'm just showing the map to you because it's a map from the French period in Vietnam and all the names are French Vietnamese equivalents. Um, I used this when I was posted to Canberra doing the intelligence desk job. And that's because um, after the Battle of Long Tan, I was, we were very carefully watching SIGINT for any sudden uh, uh, appearance of stations where we didn't expect them to be, normally be. And on one day, I saw, I saw a series of messages culminating in one that said, I can see the commandos, they're down in the valley, they're heading in this direction, I urgently need ox carts to come here and clear out the cave because we've got, um, I forget how he described it, but it was a huge amount of stocks of material, supplies, ammunition, rice and whatever. So I thought, I wonder where that's from, and I signalled back and said location of that transmission and the, the previous three, and I got them, and the locations were all over the place in about a 30-square-mile area. I thought, this is no use. I went back to... The tra not the English translations, but the Vietnamese language of the sig signals that we'd got from the enemy. And he'd said, the enemy is down at, and I'll have to invent this word because I've forgotten it. They're down on Little Pig and um, they've halted for the moment. Um, Big Pig, where we are, is only three kilometres distance or some such. And I thought, what? what's Little Pig and Big Pig? I went back to that map, looked up the Vietnamese words, went all over it square by square and discovered, discovered a pair of mountains called Little and Big. And I thought, wow, okay. So I went back to SIGINT and said, do some more DF tracking, direction finding, tracking on those signal, is anything else coming through? And they came through with one location almost near that double hill complex. Now, given the vagaries of direction finding, I thought that's as good as, when, you know, good as you, yeah. you're going to get it. So I sent off Op Immediate, which is really classy level cable, to the battalion commander, to the task force, saying, <coughs> warn the battalion that to their front, three kilometres away in the following direction, is likely to be um, a cave storing sufficient material for enemy supply, blah, 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 right? Next message I got hours later was from the same Viet Cong radio, saying the commandos have decided to make camp for the night and the ox carts are now almost here. I can see them and um, we will load up and leave. Next day, I got a message from the battalion saying, there is nothing to our front. We have had no intelligence that would reliably mean we should go and examine this area and there is no uh, sign of any enemy troops. So I filed that away and when I went back in 1967, 
I asked the Sigin guy what happened, and he went back through the records, and he said there's a note here that says Army headquarters in Canberra clearly doesn't have a grasp of these things, and there is no point in believing what they're saying. But when I reported this on the in real time to the chief of the general staff, he said, did you send them an upper immediate cable? I said, yes. He said, what'd they do? And I said, they went camp into camp for the night. Why would they do that? And he found out on his network, which I, he didn't share with me, um, was they had just decided that Canberra couldn't call the shots for what they were doing on the ground. And the battalion commander, who I met years later, said our attitude was, if we can see it, it's there. If we can't see it, it doesn't exist. And that's the point where you think, what is the point of having intelligence if you don't know how to use it? And if that attitude was pervasive, how many missed opportunities were there? Yeah. 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 Sobering. <laughs> Yes. Shattering. Actually. Shattering. Yes. Shattering. I told that story to at our Defence Intelligence College, and the class for all majors and colonels found it difficult to grasp that one should believe intelligence unless you had a reason not to believe it. And I said, no, the the protocol that they were following was don't believe intelligence unless you have positive proof. Yes. yes. Oh dear. And they yes. didn't, but the odd thing is they did as you, they didn't advance to, to find that, no. to discover that no. evidence, which is, is the strange. And we never, we never got the goodies out of the no. cave. <laughs> or no. rather, it, it's fun to look back on, but mm -hmm. it was, it was tear your hair out stuff on the day. Oh, absolutely, you, yes. So, yeah. so did you that completely mad? Did that colour your sort of your? I imagine it must have done. It coloured your your view of your role that you you played in in, in intelligence in, in Canberra. If this is one example, no. how many other times? No. no, no, not at all. I've been a strong believer in intelligence all my mm. life. Um, well, all my professional life, yes. Um, yes. to the extent where I began um, uh, the, uh, our National Australian Institute of Professional Intelligence Officers. I founded it 30 years ago this year um, because I'm a, I, I am a believer. But the real problem around the world is I've been a, a consultant in, every in various countries has been managers don't trust what they don't control. So the answer has been, this is a product you need. You've got to learn to accept it as advertised <laughs> until you can prove that you shouldn't accept it. But most yeah. managers I meet think, well, you don't, you don't answer to me, therefore I don't control you. Therefore, why should I believe you? <sighs> Yes. Do you Absolutely. believe? Yes. Do you yeah. believe you're a plumber? If you're not a plumber, why do you believe you're a plumber? Of oh, course, he's a professional. Uh, excuse me. The fence rests. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I have to say, Don, this has been absolutely fascinating. It really has, and oh. thank you for. Thank you very much for going into the the, the nitty gritty of various different scenarios you've been involved with. It's very interesting, getting a um, first hand report on some of the, the successes and, and, and otherwise <laughs> of yes, uh, your experiences. Yes. Yes. I'm, glad, I'm glad you appear to have got something out of my meanderings. Most definitely, um, yes. So there we are. Another huge thank you to Don for giving up his time and coming on and talking to me uh, over Zoom and allowing me to make this video. Hopefully you found the recollections that, that Don has from his time in the Australian Army and specifically his his service relating to Vietnam. Uh, interesting and informative, I certainly did, and it was a very interesting interview to conduct, I have to say, and thank you very much once again, Don. It really is appreciated. 
If you have found this interesting and you'd like to see more of this sort of thing, please do consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the little notification button down below. That will, of course, alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you would like to support the channel, you can. Both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below. And a huge thank you, as ever, to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. Thank you all very much indeed. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And if you'd like to get in contact but you don't really use social media, there is, of course, an email address down there as well. But that's everything for this video. So, until next time, bye for now.